give you a little bit of background about me. I've been, I started ham radio in the eighties, but then I let my license lapse. Um, that was back when you had to know Morse code for everything. So, um, now you don't need to know Morse code. So if you're interested in getting into radio, uh, most technical people can pick it up really quickly. And, um, it's more about the rules than anything else at that point. Um, but, uh, so I've been in Henry for quite a while, uh, but I got recently in the last 10 years, gotten back involved in a much bigger way than I was, you know, way back then, uh, during the day, I actually am a director of cloud security for Marriott. Uh, so I work in the cloud environments. Uh, I have a background in starting an assembler in the eighties, uh, working for commercial search equipment. Uh, I've owned an ISP and sold it. And so I've been through all kinds of different types of technology. Uh, this was the one thing that stuck with me through the whole thing. I'm, uh, you, so I have a little bit of mixture of all kinds of technologies, which is kind of make me, I guess, part of the geek thing, which is where this kind of comes in. It's because it's really um, into that technology side of things. Um, as I kind of mentioned in the beginning, Ham Pie started because I have some friends that wanted to use Raspberry Pis, didn't want to use Windows anymore. Um, and some people are just hearing about the Raspberry Pi and the Ham Radio, so they're just getting them thinking, oh, it'll be easy. But uh, most of them aren't Linux, and some of them don't even know what the Windows command line looks like. So um, some of these things require lots of compiling. Some things are just package installers. It really depends on what it is and what language it's written in. Um, so after lots of questions like, how do I get and try to help people out? I thought, well, it would be easier rather than to help all these people individually to create a script, which that's how it started. So I started creating individual scripts and then was passing them around on how to install. And then I just decided to make it a menu system, which is what HamPy became. So most of the software on HamPy is all, other people's software um, that I just install for, for them. So um, there are a few things in there that are mine. The, the conky you see on the screen, well, you haven't seen the screen yet, but the, the conky that's on there is something that I created and still being tweaked constantly. And you can, it's easily tweaked by anybody else. It's kind of technical too. So, um, let me go. I'm going to jump over to the website really quick, and we're going to walk through uh, the installation and how quick how quick it is and everything. So let me jump over to the the website here. Okay, so um, I'm a president of an organization called the Mid Atlantic Wireless Communication Group, <clears throat> and um, we started out mostly doing software, but now we're actually developing hardware, and we'll talk about some of that as well. Because HamPi does have a, a a board now you can put on your Raspberry Pi that gives you a display in addition to GPS information, which is helpful when you're doing digital modes, which we'll kind of talk about that a little bit later here too. So if you go to hampi.com, it forwards you to this page and basically it just describes um, what hampi is, like kind of basically what I just, just mentioned. And this install to get it started is you open a terminal window on Raspberry Pi, you copy this link into it and you press enter and it, it takes off and goes. So it, it try to make the install as, as simple as possible. Um, this list, uh, we've, I have a new release coming out here in about a month. It's going to have a few more pieces of software on it. Uh, like whisper, I've added whisper to, and a couple other things, uh, and stuff in the background too. automatic upgrade notifications and stuff like that, that's not in there currently. But if you look down through the list of software, we have APRX, which is uh digipeter software. It's, fo uh, it's focused on mostly on digipeating APRS, which is, um, automatic packet reporting system. They use it for location, like where your vehicle is, how fast it's going, things like that. AX25, if anybody's ever used X25, AX25 is the radio version of that. Um, it and tends up being pretty slow. If You might make 300 baud, so, um, but it does transfer data, and it's, it's kind of automated over, over the radio. Uh, the last thing, that, the most recent thing that I've added is BlueDV, and BlueDV is digital voice software that uh, can communicate with three different modes right now, D-Star, DMR, and Fusion. And I won't go into details with the are in great detail, but they are basically digital modes. So rather than transmitting FM, we transmit data, and your data is, is your voice. So it's um, these are the three most popular ones out there, and this particular software can do it without a radio. So you can be on your Raspberry Pi and talk to people all over the world on, on, on their radio through your Raspberry Pi. Chirp, which I'm going to demonstrate today, allows us to program a large variety of radios. It's most, the most popular programming software out there. It's open source and free. Um, so we install that as well. And, and Conky is the desktop widget. Um, and I just, like I said, I designed the current one that's out there. It just provides real-time details like where your location is, what software is running in the background for the for radio and the, the status of the device. And then there's a couple of different logging programs in here. This is called EQR Log, just a, a logging application. So when you're communicating with somebody, you want to keep track of who you talk to. And it, depending if you're doing a contest or whatever, um, 
they have uh, we didn't I'll get into the contest a little bit later, but this is how you keep track of who you've talked to over and you can do it over a period of time as well. I mentioned Dark Ice there. Dark Ice is what I use to broadcast to Broadcastify. It's a really simple program. Um, it's easy to install and a very simple config. All you need is your Broadcastify details and, uh, and an audio interface. Um, Direwolf is a virtual audio TNC. Well, I was going to try to get this to work today, but I didn't have time to, to get this one to work, to show it through a couple different things. Another logger program called Field Day Logger, which is designed specifically for one event of the year. Um, at the fourth, the fourth weekend of June, it's called Field Day. And it's when everybody tries to make as many contacts as they can. I saw some, some questions in the chat. Uh, does the software work with RTL, SDR, USB dongle? Yes. So there is other software that I'm going to have to... There is some things out there you can use with that. Actually, um, I think which one is here that can use that. But yes, they do. Um, actually, the Whisper one I'm getting ready to add, and the other one, there's one down here at the bottom that you can actually capture images off the off the air. Um, this QSS TV, uh, it actually so people transmit images over the over the air on many different frequencies, and this actually uses the RT, RTL RTSD dongles. In any any of the software-defined radio dongles will work with it just fine. Okay, so you know anything that would be an angle that there's an interest in. Yeah, yeah, and you don't need a license for that. You can just listen. You can always listen. So if you're interested in picking up some pictures. I will say some of them times, depending where they come from, are a little maybe a little racy, particularly ones from Europe. Um, but most of the time, it's just people's QSL cards and things like that, or stuff like that. But yeah, so that's that's the one that's in here. There's a, there's a couple other tools that are available now. Um, I, there's one of them that's kind of buggy, and it's for actually listening. So if you're on a Windows machine, you can use SDR Sharp, and you can listen to any frequency and you know any many different modes, FM or different modes as well, and there's another one like that that's available in the Raspberry Pi now, but it's a little bit buggy still. I don't know if I don't know if SDR Sharp's available yet or not. I should probably check that out, and if it is, stick it stick it out here on this one. So, um, so I'll get on Rockstar a little good through this a little quicker. FL Digi's a digital mode. So there's a bunch of different digital modes um, on HF. Um, Olivia, what well, I have this in here? Olivia, Ready, uh, Contestia. You can uh, PSKs, you know, thirty two and sixty four. You can even have it set up so FL Digi will actually transmit in Morse code for you. So you type in what you want to send, and it'll it'll transmit it for you in Morse code. So and it'll it'll also decode in Morse code. Um, so there's a couple several parts of that, and then there's a couple additional things that would go along with that. Um, FL Digi can also send messages using these these, and there's like there's message forms management and stuff like that. And there's the rig control, which I'm going to show you rig control, but not using FL Digi. I'm going to show you a different one today. Uh, G predict if you're t you st if you want to work with satellites, you want to talk to a satellite or just listen to them. You, this will give you like when they're going to fly over. Uh, I do a, a little bit of satellite communication, and um, it's kind of a fun way to figure out where things are and what's coming up. Uh, there's a GPS driver, and one of the things this is in here for is I've developed a hat for the for the Raspberry Pi that has a display. It gives you information like your grid information, like if you're contesting, uh, and gives you, it's time off a of GPS that type of thing as well. So this is what this is out here for. Uh, Ham Clock is an open source version um, uh, that shows lots of information about conditions, and I actually have it running behind me. I don't know if you, you might have. I can go back to like where I am. Um, well, that's not me. All right, I have to figure that out. What happened to what happened to mine? But um, I have it running behind me. Is one of the things on the screens up there, and basically it just shows you a map of the world and where the dark dark line is. We call it a gray line. Because when you get to the gray line, you get a lot better contacts. And where the satellites are, you want to track, and what the conditions of the sunspots are, things like that. So, uh, JS8 Call is kind of a chat program using a weak signal mode, which I'm going to show you weak signal mode today. Not not the JS8 Call, but a different one. Um, and this is tool the, the MOAIX is tools for JS8 Call. Pad is a web-based uh, WinLink client, and WinLink is email over RF. Uh, you can send uh, email to anybody on the internet. Uh, it, via a radio, you don't, need, you don't even need the internet, so you can do it for long distances. This is very popular during, WinLink is very popular during disasters because people can go into an area where there's no internet and still get out you know, pertinent information to people. So that's, that's what it's used for a lot. There's a, a program that tells you what the propagation currently is, like where you can probably talk to. Uh, another logging program right here, PyQSO. The QSS TV, is a, as I mentioned before, is it takes images off the air. 
uh, real time clock if you have one. So the uh, board I developed does have a real time clock on it as well. Um, so it's, that's very important when you get down here to some of other protocols. Uh, WX you may have already heard of. It's open source weather weather application. So it connects to many different we uh, weather systems and stuff. And this is very popular with hams because it can send out an APRS with your, with your current weather system or you're currently putting out there. So one of the other programs I'm going to do today is WSJTX. This is a called weak signal modes, and it can it's a very short protocol. You can't talk to somebody necessarily. What it does, it sends out your location, the signal strength of them and you. So it's basically like making contacts. Uh, it doesn't do any kind of like you know hello, how are you doing type of stuff. It's just basically do I hear you and how good do I hear you. And we've been in a, a, a really low sunspot cycle, so this has been become very, very popular because it, you, can, you can't even hear them sometimes and it'll still decode it. It's really interesting. And Grid Tracker is just a way of tracking like who you've talked to, uh, kind of like a contesting thing. Uh, Zaster is an APRS client, which is part of the, at the very top I mentioned about the DigiPeter stuff. So APRS is, the again, the automatic packet reporting system. And one of the things that they, Zaster does is draws a map and tells you tells you where the people are and what the weather is, like where they are, things like that. And then um, this is just another one. Yak is another version of an APRS client. Exaster is the most most popular one. Okay, let's jump over to the HamPy interface. So also, before I do that, let me show you. This is what I'm working with today. I have two radios set up. The big one right here on the right is the ICOM, is an ICOM 7300, and it's set up right now on one of the weak signal modes, and we'll show you a rig control when we get, in, get into the application. And then on the left is a really inexpensive $25, $30 uh, Beofang radio, and I'm going to show you how we can program it using the software in, in HamPy as well. All right. So with HamPy, this is what it's, it's already been installed on here. I can kind of show you what the menu looks like. I can manually can manually run it. Oops, I'm going to go to the right thing. Here we go. Too many windows look the same on my screen. So it's a very con if you everybody's seen these install programs. This is the ones built into Linux, and they can come down and they can select uh, what applications they want to install. Down, you know, this whole list is in here. Um, right now, it doesn't remember what you have installed. So that's one of the things I'm adding right now is if you already have it installed, there would be an X there saying it's been installed. So right now, you have to pick what you want. Um, so I'll pick I'll install the test application, and then when you say OK, it just asks you for your call sign and your grid square. So I'm K3DO in my grid squares FM19EI. And then it'll go through. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to control C out of it because I don't want the reboot because it does reboot at the end. Um, it'll go through and do the, the full install. And so when it's, when it's done installing, up in the menu, you have a ham radio menu and all the applications are in here. Now, some applications are, that are installed don't have a graphical interface. So they won't be in this list. Um, an example of that is the, the software to transmit to, to Broadcastify. It runs as a service, so there's no there's no interface for it up here. Um, the other thing with I should mention this if you if you want to do something like that, uh, like Broadcastify stuff that runs in the background, you don't have to have a graphical user interface. The HamPy installer looks to see do you have a graphical user interface or not. And if you don't, it won't present you with the applications that require it. It only presents you with the ones that can run in, in the command line. So it's it's smart from that point of view. You can't accidentally install something uh, without being in the right environment. Well, you can install everything in, in the graphical environment for sure. But um, if you don't have that, which like, for those Raspberry Pis I had that transmit, I just had the base install. I don't have any graphical user interface. And then you can do that same command for HamPy, and it runs the same installer. It just only gives you the option to install things that are not not requiring graphics. All right, so I'm going to do first here, we're going to go to Chirp. So Chirp, as I mentioned before, is a very popular program. It's available on Windows and, and Mac um, for reading radios. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to download from that radio. Let me bring up the uh, with the radios here. So you can see the radios on, down the bottom. The radio on the left, you should see some activity. I don't know if you can read it or not is the problem. Um, I'm going to download it's a Beofang and it's a Beofang F8HP. I'm going to say OK. And they give me a warning. They always give you this warning because it's kind of like they say it's experimental because they only have daily builds. I'm not running a daily build, but they always give you that warning. 
And you can see the radio is blinking down there. It's downloading the config from the radio. All right, so here's what's in the radio currently programmed. So this is a pretty standard. Uh, our club has a standard set of channels that we recommend because when we do events, we can just say go to channel 11 or whatever, you know, whatever rate repeater we're using. But you can see here's the repeater the listed horizontally. This is the most popular repeater in Frederick right now. Uh, 14673, it's the it's actually not W3, W3ICF anymore. It's actually W3FDK. It's like I can come in here and change that. So it's the right call sign. It uses a PL tone of 141.3, and it's an offset of negative uh, 6. So it's basically, you can go through. It's like an Excel spreadsheet. You have Each repeater has its own settings. You can go down through and change them as you want. Uh, when you're done, you go to the opposite way I just did. So I go to radio, and I do upload to radio, and say OK. And if you watch the radio, it's now uploading. So when it's done uploading, that, that repeater call sign is going to be changed to what, what it is now. And the amount of radios that this this can read and program is is pretty amazing. Uh, and it's done here. I can show you the, the long list of radios and all the different models. So if I go up here to radio and I say I want to download from the radio, here's the list of all the different radio brands that it can it can program. And if just like I'll take a Beofang for example, these are all the different models of radios from them that it can program. So pretty much program anything that's not a digital mode. I mentioned before digital modes, they're a little specialized, so they have their own, and there's not much for a Raspberry Pi from that point of view. But even some of them can be programmed through through this as well. All right, so let's go look at an, uh, a little bit of a rig control in a low, in a, I don't want to save it, in the, the program that can pick out noise or stuff in the noise. It's called WSJTX. So let's, let's wait here for a cycle, see if we hear anything. So I'll go through this a little bit. On the left-hand side is what it's hearing. And the way I'm in FT8, which is every 15 seconds, a packet is sent, basically. So after it decodes the packet, it'll show you what it hears. And I'm currently on 20 meters, which is frequency is 14.074. OK, so this is what it's hearing on the left. Um, I don't know if you can see my mouse. You can't see my mouse, maybe. But, um, on the left is what it's hearing, and if you double-click on one of these and try to reach out to one of these CQs, people calling CQ, um, it'll show on the right. So I'll go ahead and... So on the right, I just clicked on that, so I'm going to be transmitting to them now. Oh, not yet. Let me enable. Here it goes. We'll wait to the next cycle, see if it... I probably got it too late for them to hear me. So this is a really slow protocol, and all it's sending out on the first attempt right here is, um, there is it. this right here. So it's basically sending their call sign out, my call sign out, and my location. And that that's, takes 15 seconds to send that amount of data. So they didn't hear me that time. Let's see if they heard us this time or not. So that that particular person, I don't have it set up to tell me where they're from, um, but it's not the United States. It's CO. That's that's somewhere in Europe. All right. So now it's transmitting again. So the radio is being controlled by the by the Raspberry Pi. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to not transmit again. So that I show you what the control of the radio looks like. All right. So. Right here, I have 20 meters, and you see the. If you look at the radio, it's on this frequency, the 14.074. If I go change it to say 40 meters, uh, where is it? Right there. It's the seven. You see the radio has changed now. It changed its frequency. So that's that's what we call rig control. Now the other thing you can't you can't really see this because it's hidden on the screen. I got it not big enough, but this is a waterfall. So this is what the radio is decoding. You see these white, these yellow areas right here. Um, that's what it's hearing and decoding. So I changed, I changed bands 
this band doesn't have much on it right now. Let's go back to 20 meters. Because I had, had more stuff on 20 meters. So, um, you can see it's already decoding stuff right here. If you listen to this, I can turn it up so you can hear it. Where's my... I see 73. I don't know if you hear that. It's mostly, mostly noise. It's a little bit of stuff in there. But it's decoding that, that little bit of signal that it can hear in there. Um, I will say this is a very intensive process for a Raspberry Pi, so it tends to get very warm. That's one of the things to consider. Um, there's a the one Raspberry Pi I'm running has a big heat sink on it, so um, and after I do this for a little while, it gets it gets really warm. So this is the I'm running right now FT8. There's also other pro protocols that you can select from. Um, you can go up here to the mode. And the original one that this this guy created, and he's actually a uh, a college professor, but he's a really smart guy on radio. Um, was JT65. His name is John Taylor. So that's, that's just what the JT stands for. I'm not quite sure what the FT stands for. But <laughs> um, I think he had somebody working with him on, F, on FT8. And there's a couple other modes, too. The FT4 is actually even shorter, and it's mainly, mainly designed for contesting. But these these weak signal modes, another one's called Whisper. I was going to talk about that. I mentioned in, in uh, previously that was, the Whisper is in the new release. And that's because there's this little board you can put on Raspberry Pi. Let me get up to, back to my screen. Oh, I need to get me in here first. Hang on a second. Um, give me one second. Here we go. You guys see me now, right? Okay. So there's a little board, tiny little board, and it has like a through, it's, it's kind of weird how it's made. It has like a through hole that uh, goes on the Raspberry Pi, but this is a whisper board. So this will actually transmit a signal um, sometimes around the world. It's amazing. Uh, whisper is a really low, slow, weak signal mode, and it's used for figuring out like, what's open right now in a band. So that can look, you can use Whisper and say, I can talk to Europe right now, or I can talk to Australia right now, stuff like that. So that's what it's used for. Uh, Whisper is one of the modes that is supported, um, let me come back to the radios here, in here as well. So you can see Whisper right here. But there, there's actually a program you can install, it runs in the background and you help other people out too. So you, you transmit and you listen and you report back to a central location and you can figure out you know where you can talk to easily, what's open right now instead of, it's, it's some people consider it a little bit of a little bit of cheating, but it's it's good to know where to point your antenna to if you've got a directional antenna and stuff like that. All right, so that is that's just showing you the rig control um, that we have here. There's another application I'm going to run. I, didn't, I just was thinking about this as I was talking. Um, the Exaster, even though I don't have a, a TNC set up for it right now, might still pick up stuff. Let me see. I'm not going to transmit anything, but these this program also connects to the internet and it reports what it hears. But I think you can also use it to um, listen to the internet too. I'm going to try to. I haven't done that in a long time, so we'll have to see what it does here. Um. Gate. Well, maybe it doesn't. I thought it did. Nope, it doesn't look like it does. All right, so this is a mapping program. Basically, would would map, um, like what what it hears on a TNC. A TNC is a is a interface that takes a data off the radio, 
and puts it into serial serial form, and then this interprets the serial the serial data. I actually don't use a TNC now. Um, I use a, a radio interface, so it would actually require this other program that does the the mode of one here for this to work. That's why I, I tried this. Going to try this out this morning and didn't have time. So, any questions so far? Nothing in the chat, Mike. Okay. So I got a question. Who all is a radio operator? I know Mark is. Oh, good. Oh, you got a couple of you. Okay, good. It's awesome. Uh, this is Peter. Peter Fong Sam. I'm also a ham operator. Oh, great. I I, I kind of thought we'd have a couple people because lots of people that do computer stuff also are inter interested in the radio stuff too, which is great. Um, so because some people aren't ham operators. They might not pick up on what. Uh, 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 TNC is or uh, right. That's why I try, I try to explain. Basically, it's I don't have one sitting here. Even just converts data off the air to serial interface. Yeah. Or be ter even terms like twenty meters and forty meters. I mean, yeah, yeah. That's you just can kind a, of infer that, but still, you know. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's, it's just our our way of saying the frequency band that it's in. Yeah. And it actually means how long the wavelength is. So it's a twenty meter wavelength. So from from bottom to top and back to bottom, it's 20 meters. So, um, so Mark, I I have other things I can talk about open source wise if you want as well for ham radio. Yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, by all means, go in there. You you started with FL Digi, uh, you included that as well, uh, and anything of that. The things like um, some of the things for people who aren't licensed to transmit, uh, several of those utilities are offline uh, type utilities like uh, the yeah. satellite prediction, for example. Yep. yep. And that, that sort of thing. So it's not all you don't, everything, you, like you were saying, everything you do is not necessarily always on air, um, but it's useful for right. your on air operation. We got, I know a lot of people that do things that are, they don't have a license for, and they list, it's more listening, you know, obviously, because you can't transmit. Anybody but there's interesting listen. things, yeah. There's also interesting things out there. The whole thing with putting the scanner on Broadcastify is another good example. You know, you can put anything you can audio-wise on Broadcastify. I mean, Broadcastify is designed for, uh, not for streaming audio like music, but, you know, radios and stuff like that. So um, that's one of them. There's also a bunch of other uh, open source type things. So, um Who's ever heard of AIS? Does anybody know what AIS is? So this is an automated reporting system for boats. And you can get the, an AIS board. Let me go back to, I'm holding it up like you can see it, but you can't. Um, you can get an AIS board for a Raspberry Pi, and the software is free. You put an antenna on it, and you can watch where boats are, boats and ships are. Um, up here in Frederick, I'm kind of I'm past Jefferson on the other side of the mountain. I get very, very little um, of that, but it was, I'm... I like boating and stuff like that, so it's something the fun. If we go on vacation, I'll I'll take something like an AIS board or something just to listen to what ships are around and, and what they're doing. So it's very interesting. That's that's another, that's another option. Um, so I also want to show you this. This is a, a Raspberry Pi that is a, it's a first Raspberry Pi, Raspberry Pi One, that was out on my tower for over five years doing ADSB. So it, allowed, it tracked airplanes, um, not necessarily ham radio related, but it's again it's an off the air thing. Um, and I was transmitting it. I have no one up there now because it finally said it's been out there for five years. So anybody tells you they don't survive in the cold, that's not true because it gets cold and windy here. <laughs> so um, it it's, was still functioning when I took it down. I, just, I was on the tower doing other work. I'm like, well, I'm here. I'm going to put a new Raspberry Pi up here. So um, another another interesting thing you can do. Um, hey, Mike. Yeah. Um, with So I've had trouble with SD cards. Uh, and the Raspberry Pi booting up into like read-only mode when I leave it outside for a year or two. Have yeah. have you? Uh, I guess the SD card starts to fail. It doesn't fully fail. The the Pi boots up, but then um, the operating system is read-only. I guess. Um, it, does it come like a solid green light? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I've I, had I don't that. know if you you replace your SD cards on a frequency when you're using them like that, or did that did that well, SD card last for five years? Yeah, that SD card. So the new one I got the small SD card. So we'll see how it, it compares because this is one of the original, you know, the big the big SD cards. So maybe it's a difference. You know, it's it's like this. I can't even pull it out. You see, I have spiders even in there growing or nests and stuff. But it's one of the you know, it's not the minute micro SDs. So I don't know if it's a difference or not. That's something we'll find out because the one I got up there now is a Raspberry Pi three. 
and uh, it has a micro card in it. So we'll see how that, how that functions. Um, that may be part of it. But I, I will say this, um, and I'm going to show you a couple other web interfaces of other things that are running on Raspberry Pis um, that are actually controlling com, 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 uh, system, complete systems. So, uh, so far I've been lucky, I think. I've had certain cards, particularly ones with Broadcastify, that that do go solid, like a solid green. It reboots itself and it doesn't want to boot up anymore. So, yeah, I've had that problem with, with those cards. Not necessarily outside, I've had that problem inside. So I don't know if it's temperature related or not. Um, that's, that's, that's a great question. I'll let you know. So what I do with the repeater sites is actually I, I duplicate the card after I get it built and I leave it in a case up there. So if ever that happens, I don't have to go reload everything. I just yank it out and then, you know, so. And I keep an image on my local machine so I can make a new one as a backup. So um, I haven't had it happen yet up, up there. And that's up there at the repeater site. There's no temperature control. It's either cold or hot depending on what is outside. So it gets the same fluctuations up there. Um, so there's another thing that's kind of related, related, and this um, this is a rack case. But what's what is in it is um, LoRa, LoRaWAN. So if you've heard of LoRaWAN, it's a very low power. Um, I got one on top of the mountain, and I can get 20 miles on just milliwatts. So it's it's pretty pretty amazing actually. So I'm actually on the that's called the Things Network. It's the European version of, the, of their stuff. So um, all my stuff. I have three of these now that are are set up, and this is my fourth one. So I cover most of Frederick County because I have them up on high locations, except for the one at the house here is not super high. But so that's an, so great. You guys are familiar with that. That's that one of the other things that uh, you can do. Um, let me jump up. I want to show you like the so this is a Raspberry Pi uh, W zero W, um, and this is actually a mini repeater. It can do about five different digital modes. So it's real, It's only like twenty five milliwatts output. But if you have a digital mode, like you have a digital radio, like like one of these, it does DMR. You can set up in your house, and rather than rather than using the repeater on the mountain, you just use this, and you're not interfering with anybody. So these are very, these are very popular, as well. Um, and I can I'm going to bring up the same software that runs this runs the repeater. So it, it, I'm going to bring it up and show you what it looks like. Uh, and if you see behind me, right backwards, right here, those three are are three hotspots, which are basically one of these. And I got instead of one for each mode. This can do multiple modes. What it does, it scans all the modes. And I can kind of show you that when I get it. Let me log into the repeater site up here. Show you one of the repeater sites. All right. Where was my web interface? There we go. So this is um, called PyStar. It's free software, open source. You can download and and this is my repeater on the mountain. It's putting out 100 watts. You can talk to it on a, on a handy talkie in Baltimore, if you're if you're not downtown, if you're like right outside this at the Beltway. So it's it has good coverage. Uh, digital modes typically have a lot more coverage than what uh, um, analog does. The problem with digital modes, if you get to the end, it either either works or doesn't work. It's not like analog work; it's noisy or something like that. But what you see here is I'm running up there. I'm running both D Star and DMR. Uh, on the same one. And it can also do uh, Yeezy System Fusion. It can do NXDN and P25 are the other ones it can do. Um, the other thing that's interesting is here, let me see who remembers. I'm trying to look at your ages. Who, who remembers one of these? Uh, who remembers what this is? <laughs> these, this repeater that's up there can also transmit POXAG, which is what this is, the POXAG um, uh, pager. And there's a, pretty much a common frequency that everybody uses for that. And uh, this repeater that uh, we had up on the screen there, uh, one of the things it can do is POXAG. Is it listed here somewhere? Yeah, right here. Um, you can't see it, but the top right you know, is DMR, P25, NXT, and then POXAG. So um, the repeater currently is not turned on to do POXAG. Um, my hotspot, actually, the, the hotspot I had in my hand was what I was using, using it to test with. Um, but now that I've tested it, it seems like it's pretty easy to use and not very disruptive, so I may turn it on up there. Um, not that we need it, because within about 100 yards of where my repeater is, there's a 1,000-watt pager transmitter up there that just walks on top of us all the time. So anyways, on the screen, um, you see it's listening for both D-Star and DMR, and what it's doing is it's alternating. It's going back and forth. Listen to the same frequency, but it's listening for different modes. So if I would key up on DMR, and we might see it happen here. It's kind of quiet, looks like, today. 
uh, it'll say listening DMR for 10 seconds to wait to see if anybody else follows it. And then it'll go back in the listening mode where and that's just where it's going back and forth. On the right, you see all the different contacts. So our last one was D star at 1042. What time is it? So it's like a couple minutes ago. Um, you can see who it was and what they, what, who, what they were talking to. And here's a, there's also a DMR in there for a talk group. It gives you how long they talked and what the, the loss and bit error rate is. And this is all running on a Raspberry Pi. Um, this Raspberry Pi is a custom built Raspberry Pi. It's not even a res. It's a, a micro Raspberry Pi. I can't remember what brand it is. Soldered to a bigger board. It's for the repeater. Um, so these Raspberry Raspberry Pis are super powerful for stuff like this. It doesn't take a lot of CPU um, to to process this. Like I said, this is a hundred watt, and then the little radio I had in my hand or the hotspot was twenty five milliwatts. So it's a you know, big difference in power. The other thing, so um, let's see. The other thing is, I I maintain a bunch of repeaters, and I'm replacing a whole repeater system up on the mountain. And this is a Raspberry Pi in a 3D printed case. You can see I'm still testing it, and it's connected to an audio interface like this, and it plugs in the back of the repeater controller. So we currently have Echo Link at this at this site, um, and I'm redoing how the whole site works because it was a mess. When I got when I got it, um, but that actually runs software from All Star, which is running. Uh, it can run Echo Link, but it can also run All Star, and All Star is running on um, Asterix, so it's an open source system as well. So that little Raspberry Pi is going to control the whole whole repeater system up there. Um, so yeah, there, there, there's not really a graphical user interface for that. In fact, the user interface for that's uh, text based. It's a you know, command line command line based. So Raspberry Pis are are very becoming very popular in ham radio. And so in that case, um, I'm actually using a, a small card too, and I'll put, a, I'll put a spare card next to it. So I have to run up there and, and replace it. Um, the building that it's in, uh, if I can, maybe I can bring up one of the, uh, let me do this. I can bring up, it's dark up there, but the cameras have lights on them. So let me, Let me find a camera I can bring up here. So the other thing I'm going to, I'm going to talk about here in a second is um, another. I don't want to do that. I'm going to make it full full screen. All right. Well, I'm just going to bring it up on like like it is. Then. So this is. One repeater site. This is one that we're changing out. So uh, you see there's cables laying out because we've already taken out a couple pieces of equipment and ready to put in some new equipment, um, which that's part of it. And then I have another piece coming today. That should be the final piece. But we're replacing the controller. But this is what a re their, the repeater site looks like for the 7.3 repeater and the two D-Star repeaters. So nothing fancy. It's like I said, it's a mess right now. Um, and the Raspberry Pi, I'm just going to rack mount here on the, on the side. There's a... You can't see it here, but right up, right up top of the right, there's um, a, con a repeater controller, and the controller um, is being replaced as well. The person who put it in highly modified it, <laughs> so it took us almost two months to figure out exactly what he had done. We just finally figured it out just recently, as a matter of fact. And uh, all right, so yeah, I do have another repeater site. We can let me get out of this one. It's it's actually the same site, just a different a different view, different room. Put it that way. Not that one. That's the door. So this is uh, the the different room. It's the same building, different room. And uh, if you look at the towards the top, you see the network switch, and beneath that, you'll see a motor roller repeater. Uh, it's kind of hard to see. Um, that's actually the middle repeater has a board in it that has that red, little tiny Raspberry Pi thing in it, and that's the 100 watt uh, repeater. And beneath that is what we call Echo Link. And I mentioned before, a long distance transmission that is also run by a Raspberry Pi. Um, it's running two different RF, or three different RFs: one UHF, a VHF, and an HF. And the HF band is scanning, so it scans um, five. 
different bands, I think, now. I think we have it set up. So it's sitting there scanning in a circle, basically. Um, and that's all run by Raspberry Pi. It's amazing how powerful these things can be for, for radio stuff. Um, right beneath the blinking lights is the APRS. You'll see that Raspberry Pi is mounted, it's just mounted on a shelf <laughs> with a radio next to it. It's a Yaesu 2600. And you see the light blinking on it. That's doing APRS. And we can communicate via APRS up through Chambersburg, down down into Baltimore used to do this one because we're very high up in the air. We're on top of Gamble Mountain. And this antenna is probably 120 feet above the ground in Gamble Mountain, too. So very, very long distance stuff. Um, one of the other open source things not related to Raspberry Pi, though, is um, it's called Arden, and it runs on literal routers. Um, that's, how we're getting, that's how I'm getting the video that we see seeing is through an Arden network. Um, we run you can something like this a little thirty five dollar router you can you can install it on and you can connect up to the connect up to our network we have an open network even if not RF you don't want to do RF we have a, a tunnel set up as well that you can connect to and then you can get access to all the cameras uh, that we have as well um, we do have a node up on Gambrel that that transmits over the air um, on both um, two point four gigahertz and five gigahertz and it's a it's a ninety degree Kind of. There's a little bit of a mountain in the way, so we can't get to South Frederick. But if you have a radio like that and or a directional antenna and you want to connect to Arden, we can definitely have that available, too. All open source. Um, that's another open source project that's interesting to follow. The interesting thing about ham radio with, when it comes to that, though, is you can't encrypt. So you can't use SSH. Um, I mean, you technically can. it's technically possible, but you're not allowed to. Um, so we do kind of restrict what, what's allowed to go across it. So anything you do is not encrypted. There's no privacy assumed when it comes to amateur radio. Something else to think about, too. All right. Anything else, Mark? Mike, I, oh, Mike, okay. uh, the, the, the AmperNet with the, the IP address for 44 that's yep. associated with for ham radio mm -hmm. might be of interest to, to some people, the ability to have your own IP address through ham right. radio. Yep, exactly. So a, a lot of people use that. So there's a, a and I, I don't know what its status is because the person who was running it left and I did I got uninvolved in it, but there is a system here in in this area um, that does um, point to point using Ubiquity gear point to point uh, over commercial frequencies, not using the stuff for Arden, um, and they um, were using the 44 network. That's the first time I really got involved in it. So they gave them a whole big section of 44. They could break it up as they wanted. Of course, they ended up putting it together all in layer two, over hundreds of miles. And I'm like, there's no redundancy in layer two, <laughs> first of all, and you could be routing the whole way around in a circle when you're right next to something. So they don't understand routing. That's kind of why I got uninvolved in them because it's, I can't make a network that's over the air for 300 miles using layer two. It just to me, to me is wrong. So I got kind of uninvolved in it. But no, they had the 44 addresses. Um, is available. It doesn't take much to get it. They won't give you much unless you can prove you need you have a need for it. But most definitely available. Any other questions? I didn't fill up your two hours. <laughs> no. Well, usually, like I was kind of saying earlier, kind of like our standard uh, or or default, you know, configuration is. Do, do a presentation for roughly an hour, nominally an hour, and that allows you know, an hour Q&A or additional discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the things that, you know, we t there's no way uh, you could address everything that's on the ham pie, you know, in an hour yeah. presentation uh, yeah. in terms of all the, uh, all the utilities. Um, the... One thing I had tried uh, that you do have packaged there, although I, I downloaded it uh, from the Fedora repositories uh, onto my desktop, and that was the QSSTV thing. And I was mm -hmm. what, what I did was, and, I, I, and I'm thinking of doing a, a presentation myself later on in the year over using one of the web SDRs to, uh, as a signal. So mm -hmm. that, and then you run something like FL Digi or QSSTV and you can decode this stuff, you know, with right. receive mode, you know, without. Um, but I, I was uh, one of the things I had trouble finding was where on the air, you know, can you find, you know, fax transmissions like for weather facts? That's probably not, not a thing I, anymore. I can send you that stuff. It. Well, they still do it. Yeah. They still do it. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, the fact still trans- is still still transmitted. I don't know if they ever stop it completely because uh, I know it's mostly over satellite now. But what if you get somebody that has old old equipment or something or has a weather facts? So I know they still use it. Um, they definitely use it up in in Alaska. They, they actually rely on it a lot because the, when you're up that high, sometimes where the satellite depends on what satellite that depends on what kind of you know signal strength you have for it. So the satellite is below the horizon when yeah, you point it, your dish at it. Yeah, it depends on where. So they got they got other satellites up there too. That's another thing. So. Um, I installed in the new version coming out the ability to decode NOAA weather satellites. So with um, a dongle, like a, a software-defined radio dongle, you can receive all, off the air as it flies over you. And then basically what it is is they're taking a picture, constant picture, and they're sending out a video stream. So you capture that video stream, then you can decode it, and you can get, a, you can get the actual picture of the clouds and um, stuff like that. Oh, you're catching it from the uh, low-Earth orbit satellite. I was trying yeah, to find, yeah. I was, the, yeah, I was you're monitoring looking. their posted HF frequencies, and yeah, there's right. nothing there. Well, yeah, yeah, no, right. So there are, there is not in this area because we're not, we're, we're not close enough to the water. Weather fact is mostly used for 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 boats Maritime, and stuff. But, yeah, yeah. Um, I think there is one I can occasionally hear, but I never got a good enough signal to say it was a good quality. <laughs> so I think it really depends on propagation. Um, but no, so with those those dongles, you can receive. You only get a you know whatever it's flying over. And I have a QFH antenna, which is it looks like a egg beater basically. It's a it's twisted and twisted antenna, that, so it gets any direction. Um, to receive those, um, and you can you only get like if if it's flying over like uh, West Virginia, you'll get that whatever it's flying over. You know you won't you won't get. And then you, depending how far away it is, depends on how long you get it. If it's flying directly over you, you get the best longest reception. But um, they they're constantly on the move, and there's I think there's seven of them now that go constantly on the move, and they go north to south. Um, so they don't go a lot of things go east to west or they they alternate the egg beater up and down from east to west these go north to south they're polarized to the top top of the earth so something also you know, it's interesting to you know kind of get off the air you can listen to the international space station uh as it goes across there's satellites up there that for ham radio operators and you can get the international space station and sometimes like on a little handheld radio like this it depends on how close it is to you uh, you can you can hear it so yeah, it's all kinds of fun things to do. I mean, there's almost unlimited list of stuff to do on ham radio, and they're all free for the most part. So, so what's your recommendation to get started? So my foray into Project Twenty Five and trying to listen to the local police dispatch was really just going on the internet and sort of reading the recipes, but not mm-hmm. necessarily getting the theory behind it. It's just like, here's the things you need to do. And if you do these things, you get this result. And then you try to figure out why you didn't get that result. And, you know, you just don't have the background. So what is your recommendation here? And and that could be like, you know, you need a four-year degree in electronics or... No, not at all. (laughs) There's actually, we have a 14-year-old that's going to take his test today um, that we've been helping out. So I don't know if he's going to pass or not. But, you know, I know, I've known eight-year-olds that do Morse code because their families uh, don't have phones, they they use radio for everything. Um, you know they don't believe in phones, so it's one of those you know, type of things. Um, so uh, I would say there are some resources that I can send to Mark that we when you get ready to take a ham radio class, we have some rec- recommended resources that you start reading. And it's but it's very focused on passing a test, so that's the only thing. If you want rule theory, you probably better to go to like an ARL book. Like ARL makes a, a technician's guide which explains it better. What we do with the ham in a day classes, which is what I was, I was going to send is like, here's the, here's the question and the answer. It's, and that's, I'll put this up there right away. Um, for ham radio, the questions and answers are all published. So there's no question. I mean, you can, you can download them and, and keep reading through them. And there's a site we have that we recommend uh, called hamstudy.org and it uses flashcards and it'll keep asking you the same question. And if you keep missing it, it'll keep bringing it back up. So you know, you get burned into your head not really learning techn- technology at that point, learning the answer, but it's another way to get it. Um, but I would say an ARL technician handbook would start giving you the good background that you need, a uh, solid background on the radio radio side. Um, I'm not familiar with the P25 or with the 25 project. It's probably because it's P25 is what police mostly use. Uh, that's what we use here in Frederick is, is P25. Um, some of them are starting to move to DMR and DMR is just a derivative of P25. It's a two-channel. Um, on one frequency, you can have two conversations. It's all digital, or P25 uh, phase. Well, we're phase two here, not phase three. Um, but yeah, so and the, the, it's encrypted too. So you got to figure out how to decrypt it. That may be another thing you run into. You know, Frederick, we the the uh, well, the city's encrypted, the county's not. 
So, so my son recently told me they just upgraded all the radios for the county. So they bought very expensive AX-25s, I think, for mm-hmm. all, all, the, all the police units at least, maybe even fire and, and other resources. So in July, they're going to do a cutover. So Frederick is doing a – and I'll talk about this in my talk on, in June. But they're doing a pretty good compromise where the main dispatch channel will not be encrypted. Well, they can't they can't unencrypt that because people still use those voice pagers. So if you if you encrypt the voice that channel, the old style voice pager that people wear on their on their side don't work. So so they're going to leave that open or, or unencrypted, but everything else will go encrypted. And you're okay. right, the, the city is fully encrypted. The city right. encrypts their de- de- encrypts their dispatch and everything. So yeah. now, well, no, the dispatch is their dispatch. There is a, the fire dispatch is not encrypted. I put that way. Okay. I don't know about the police dispatch. Yeah, the, the police channels are all encrypted. But but the interesting thing is that they're able to um, now talk to the city. So the county and the city can now interoperate more mm-hmm. easily because they're they have they're sharing keys. I guess is right. So, on, so. yeah, it, it it is pretty limited, like what you can hear. And and I think some of the broadcastify channels just kind of amalgamate too much stuff, so things step on each other quite often. I've, I've noticed that too. They put it all in one thing, and the, the police sometimes at times and that gets kind of busy. <laughs> so, uh, so Jack Markey is the, the county county guy. I know Jack pretty well. Um, one of our club repeaters, actually, but two two of the FARC club repeaters, not not the FARGs, are actually in county sites. So I work with Jack pretty regularly. If I need to get in work on them, I need to get with Jack, so I know him pretty well. He's been really good to us as far as the county goes. And then the cost of some of this equipment is quite high. Like I know, I know scanners are crazy expensive. Scanners cost more than two-way radios do. I mean, it's pretty pretty crazy. <laughs> well, I think my son said his radio that was issued to them is thousands of dollars. Oh, oh yeah. So like, I, I can give you an example. The the radio that you wear on your side, like a fire fire department, the big yellow ones everybody always wears. They're like twenty five hundred dollars for the radio, and the microphone's like three hundred dollars. And then you know it's craziness, craziness. Yeah, and in, in the, the in vehicle ones, I don't know what they cost. Actually, I don't know if you can see these. These are old style in vehicle radios. Um, they can do P twenty five, but I'm actually they're hundred watts. I bought them used, and I'm going to use them for APRS and a couple other things up on the mountains. So I'm trying to program them. That's what you see. You re- requires Windows uh, Windows XP to program that stuff. So. That's an old Windows XP laptop, just for that reason. But no, those radios are super expensive. It's it's crazy how expensive they are. And I don't know, I don't know why they're so expensive. But yeah, when it comes to scanners, that's if you're getting a scanner that can do decode, they're expensive too. Um, I have a scanner. Where is it? This side, right there. But it doesn't decode P25, so I'm I'm losing out <laughs> what I can get um, right now. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's what I'll talk about in June is the Op25 project and just my experiments with it, getting it to decode the police channels. And it's just a lot of steps. Like I said, I followed a recipe. Mm-hmm. Understanding more of the theory behind it, I think, is cool, too. But. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I mean, I, I, I didn't know that project even existed. So I don't have to ask people when it comes to decoding that stuff. I don't I don't do that very often. I'm very much in the ham, the ham radio stuff. Well, I also have a commercial license, too. So I have I – have, we do events for, like uh, – well – from a ham radio side, we do events for like bike races and stuff like Tour de Frederick, and all our operators will will put it out there. And some of them will be at rest stops, some of them will ride in vehicles that run behind, you know, the SAG vehicles, the sport and gear vehicles. And then we dispatch. And then there's people on site, and the ones on site typically aren't licensed. So I have um, a license that's commercial, so I can hand out a radio to anybody. It runs under my. It's kind of like what you do for like a Walmart or something like that. Um, and they can use a radio that's you know licensed and not in a common frequency, so there's no interference and stuff like that. Is there any? Does anyone have uh, one? We've touched on so many different things. Uh, you can put it in the chat or just pop in, you know, with a comment. Uh, what of all the many things we touched on this morning would you like to know more detail about? Because every single one of these things, you could do an entire talk on, and and still not cover the. Uh, uh, someone uh, uh, posted, uh, Arden. Okay. Uh, uh, is the is there's interested in that, Mike? Would you like to go uh, into more detail yeah. on that? I mean, I could bring it up on the web here too, actually. Um, I actually had a hard time with Arden 
with the concept of Arden at first, because being a network engineer, you know, I'm a CCNP, I didn't like how they were doing a couple of things. And then also the fact that I was working with the other group here locally that, that was um, doing the point to point stuff and they could, they could encrypt stuff because they were all using, they were using um, regular frequencies. So what Arden does, there's um, some frequencies just outside of what we, you consider channel one on two gigahertz or 2.4 gigahertz. And um, it's just outside of, I think it's channel one on the five gigahertz too. And so there's, as a ham radio operator, you're licensed to use that band, whereas the average consumer isn't. So they they shift that frequency down into that area because it's not being used by anybody. So there's a lot, a lot less interference. But Arden is, um, because it's ham radio, you can't encrypt data, which is a, a problem in, in the, to me because I'm a security guy. <laughs> I like everything being secured. Um, so yeah, that definitely um, is p- part, of, part of my problem. So you can transmit voice over IP, you can do cameras, there's so all kinds of different software that you can, you can install that helps with dispatching, but everything is open, basically, if somebody's listening in. That's the only problem. So Arden is actually a mesh network, um, and uh, can I log into one of those? I can, I'm can. i afraid I might drop you guys if I do it. I can connect into our Arden system, so Arden doesn't connect to the internet. Um, it can, but then that brings up you know, HTTPS sites, which you can't, you can't use as... Uh, TLS or anything because that's, that's encryption. Um, so I generally don't connect it to that. So there's, it's an actually independent network, but it's not. It's self-configurable. It doesn't. You don't have much choice with what it, with what it does. It will listen for its neighbors and it will automatically add them in as a link. Um, I mean, how can I do this without? Is without, it an open can, source project? Could it's open source. Submit uh, you know pull requests yep, or something. Absolutely, like that? absolutely. It's open source. Um, it started out, you used to call it HSMM Mesh, and then uh, groups kind of spun off of that and created Arden, which is much more organized than what the HSMM Mesh, HSMM mesh was. So, um, yeah, I'm trying to think how I can best way to... Let me see if I can find some... So if you go to ardenmesh.org, you can get all... The software's available for download for free. Um, if you go to downloads, you can see... Um, it tells you how to install it. Right here, and then you can go over here to download it. I'm trying to find out the list. There's a list of devices that they support, you know, out of the box. Oh, there it is. You can see it right there. Um, so for Microtik, which is what I had here, um, they support the one I've been using is the HAPAC lights. Um, up at the up on the hill, that we use, you know, um, Ubiquity gear. So the ones here at the house I have are just these HAPAC lights because they're so inexpensive and fun to play with and, and stuff. But you can use all these different uh, pieces of hardware. Uh, TP-Link is another one. I'm not a TP-Link fan, but that was um, GL to INET. I'm not sure what that is. And then Ubiquity. Almost all the Ubiquity stuff works works with it. Um, and I use a lot of Ubiquity. Um, um, well, the rocket, we use the rockets, um, rocket dishes, and then we use the beams and uh, the M2s and M5s we use as well. So, you know, all that stuff easily, easily works. Um but well, you can download the firmware. Um, depending on what device it is, it's, it may be a little more difficult to to install. Um, I think the most difficult actually is the one that I have here because you got to install a bootloader first, and then you go into the bootloader, and then you and then you upload this this sys upgrade file. So it takes a, a while to go through. Um, the the Ubiquity gear is really easy to install. It's one one upload and it reboots and it's done. Um, but uh, it's just a, a really fun thing to play with. I I kind of like I said I shied away from it for a while just because I was working on a network that was encrypt could handle encryption, um, but for what it is, it works really really good. And there's also let me see if I can find the recommended software. There's a ton of software that runs like on a Raspberry Pi. In fact, the, the Ham Pi has it has it on there. Um, actually, I can go look here. I can see some of it real quick. Um, let's see. Well, maybe it's not listed here. I don't see it. M. Well, it has it on there because that's where I install it from. There's a bunch of mesh. It's mesh mesh software. Like there's a mesh chat. There's a thing that keeps track of like where your vehicles are at. Um, Tickets for. Let me see if I have it out here. 
I might have it on the art inside. Oh, so here's what we we have a we have cameras set up. Obviously, I showed you a couple of those. Um, mesh map, which just draws a map of where all the different nodes are. Um, we have a wiki out there. Mesh chat, team talk, which are these are two are very similar. Uh, work a little bit differently. We have a file section. We have a BBS, and we didn't talk about BBSs um, for ham radio, but uh, we have VoIP. Uh, Mattermost is another group chat, and we have some um, weather stuff we're putting up right now. So, and there's uh, I can't think of the name of the other open source software that's installed that keeps track of tickets. Like if somebody, if you're in a disaster and you're using it for that, you can put in tickets that things that need to be done, and you can assign the people and, and track it. It's a dispatch type software. But, What's um, the weather wrap you have listed there at the bottom? Actually, the weather being in, I guess, being developed. But uh, but well, so I'm it's this is what we have on our network. The this is actually WX is what we're so. I just didn't have a weather system to set it up with yet. That's why it was in progress. And now I have it up there, so um, it's it's on there. Actually, it's it's actually <laughs> so this is a, a weather system that I designed. It's a uh, it runs on solar. And I custom design PC electronics all the time, so this is what it's in, inside of it. And the temperature sensor, light sensor is on this one. On this one here, but it's not on this one. Start charged by solar. So this reports in um, has a web interface, and you can see that now from from there. So, well, WX is what we generally use for for weather. And so is the other thing. So I think I mentioned this before. Maybe I didn't. Um, these little router boards, if you want to experiment with it, they're like $45 or something like that, $49. I can't remember exactly. Um, we have a tunnel system. So Arden has a ton ability to do tunnels. And so if you're not within range of uh, on the air site, you can actually uh, tunnel into it, which is what – and then when you tunnel into it, you see everything else. That's what I'm going to try to show you, but I'm afraid I'd disconnect everything if I connect to it. Um, I'm trying to think where I would – have something I, I can't think of where I could get into. It. Anyways, if when you connect into our network, uh, you can see all the different nodes: the ones that are wireless, the ones that are, are via tunnel. Um, there's a, uh, a network concept called DTD, which is direct to device, which means it's, it sees another device. Um, it's like a special VLAN that you plug all these devices in together, and they talk and talk to each other automatically. Mike, one comment in the chat about tunneling is uh, uh, usually people associate tunneling something with encryption because they think VPNs and that sort of thing. Uh, yeah. You want to talk about the unencrypted tunneling? Uh, well, it's not unencrypted. It's encrypted. Yeah. So you're not going so over the air. You're not. Okay. So you can't. This is something because FCC rules about amateur radio. You can't right. send this over a handband. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. You can communicate over the internet encrypted. So it is, an, it is an encrypted tunnel. It's a very weak encrypted tunnel. Um, so you could tunnel up to the point to where it, then it yes. comes out and <laughs> yeah. it's decrypted. Then you send it over the air. Right. So um, we do have a couple of these. Like I have one in Hagerstown and my my one here that you can get to the Internet via because I'm plugging directly into it. So that's that's why. I mean, if you show over the air, you can't you can't do it. And I only do it because I know, I know the rules. I don't do it everywhere because – you know, not everybody remembers that you can't, or doesn't even understand that you, when you go to a secure website, you know, you're, you're encrypted. So, well. yeah, it's an interesting project. And like I said, if you if you go into these things and you want to connect to it, or you have to have a ham radio license to to use it because it does require you to enter that information in. Uh, but if you get one of these, you want to connect up to the network, just let me know, and I give you a, a an address. And a password, and you connect up to the network, and immediately you'll see all the different tunnels and and sites and everything we have connected up. One thing you mentioned earlier that you have at the repeater site that is used a lot, for example, on the weather net on Thursday nights, for, is the Echo Link connection. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I think uh, the the name came up, but someone who hasn't used it might not um, make the connection between. You know, oh, talking okay, yeah. all over right. the air using your computer because you can't, like as you mentioned before, like Arden, you you have to have a ham license to be able to register with Echo Link in the first place because right. you're actually transmitting. Right. So Echo Link is a voice over IP. Um, you can use it on your phone or your computer or anything. Pretty much anything now. I don't know if the Raspberry Pi actually has a client or not for it. But you, when you log into it, first of all, he's right. You have to have a. You can't get an account unless you have a license. They they do verify that. Um, but once you're connected, you can connect repeaters all over the world using voice over IP, and then you're going out over the air. 
Um, like if I'm traveling in Florida and I want to connect up here to Frederick, I can connect up to the repeater and transmit over it just like I'm sitting here. Um, it just you know, with with the radio. In fact, a lot of people use that instead of a radio, uh, even if they're kind of close because it's, they're on the computer and they don't want to go down to, the, to where the radios are or, or something like that. So, um, and you can do uh, echo link to echo link as well and link up repeaters. So a good example is uh, the third Friday of every month, our repeater links up to uh, a talk or a, what do they call it a conference room down in Washington D.C. and a bunch of other ones do the same thing. And we have a, a monthly net for. ARL for the Aries, uh, the Amateur Radio Emergency Services Group, and our our local rep, you know, gives a an hour talk on ask questions and everybody checks in and says hi and um, and it's all done through Echolink. If you're on the repeater, you're using RF to get to the repeater, and then the repeater puts it on the internet via Echolink to another repeater has Echolink, and then it puts it back on the air there. So yeah, and you can link a bunch of them together. It's just a, a really nice way to do voice over IP. It's been around for since, since 2005 or six, something like that, quite a while. It came out of PalTalk. I don't know if you've ever, ever heard of PalTalk, but the guy who created PalTalk took it and then modified it for Echolink. Same guy um, does that. Now it's being maintained by other people. But I mean, just to go way, way back, FidoNet was radio-based, wasn't it? There was like the original. No, no, no. no it, 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 some of it might have been, but my FidoNet days when with the early Linux, or obviously with Linux, and it was just Unix. Um, uh, I used basically was using SCO Unix back then. Yeah, that was pre Linux, actually. Yeah, right. That's that was all done via modems, like dial up modems. When I was using it, I don't know. It could be the radio too. So it's AX twenty five. If you AX twenty five is X twenty five, but over the over the air. Um, like I said, it's about three hundred baud, which back then was probably about about what we were getting on FidoNet too. Um, and FidoNet was on BBSs and you know a bunch of other things too. I don't know that it's ever over the air. Um, that I can remember. It's possible, though. Very possible. So, and speaking of that, so, I don't know who remembers the old Dallop BBSs, but, um, yeah, I do, too. I used to run one. <laughs> That's how I got to become an ISP, actually. Um, there, There is still BBSs around for radio. Um, in fact, there's, in Frederick here, it's one, probably one of the bigger ones right now, and it's N3HYM. He's up on top of uh, Braddock, Braddock Heights, and uh, you basically use a terminal, like a, a serial terminal, and use a TNC, which I mentioned before, a TNC. And when you're in a TNC, think of it as a modem. Some of them actually use AT commands. Um, people use the AT commands. Um, but, like, you would just do C space N3HYM-5, which is his node number, and you it does a little back and forth on radio and says connected, and then you get his BBS prompt. No, there's no graphics because it's very slow. Um so you don't get like the old uh, pixelated graphics coming down or anything like that. You get Was very that the old Hayes modem command set. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah, some of them have that in it. Not all of them do that. Um, the ones I use typically don't have them, but some of them had that in there, so you're used to it. Like you do ATC, you know, to connect and or ATD or whatever it was mm-hmm. to dial. Um, but yeah, so they're still around. Um, people use them for messaging. A lot of the emergency traffic messaging goes across those bulletin boards still. It's not not super fast. They have chat rooms. I keep getting in there and looking, but nobody's ever in them. So I, don't, I never really to chat with anybody, but yeah, there's still there's, those things are, are around too, and that's that's packet, uh, and it seems like packet's getting coming back a little bit of a surge coming back as far as uh, I think people like Ray and 3HYM on you know, are really pushing it, and um, it's becoming a little, a little bit more popular, something different, I guess maybe more anything, but it's it's a, it's excruciatingly slow. It brings you back to the old modem days for sure. Calling for additional questions. I mean, it, yeah, it, you, you had mentioned what's legal or illegal. So, so what what governs this? I guess there's a whole set of laws around ham radio. Yep, it's it's part. Um, SCC has the has a, you know part nine seven rules and stuff. So most definitely, um, there. Like I said, the, it's a pretty easy to get the rules. I can actually send a link to the the rules if anybody wants them. Um, and that's the hardest part of the first test is learning the rules because. Well, so electronics, and if you if you can know basic electronics, real basic electronics, just how to calculate what Ohm's law is, you won't have any problem with with the first test, and um, and it's all divisible by ten, and all those questions are divisible by ten, so you can just do it in your head. I think they do that on they do that on purpose. People bring calculators. I'm like, you're not going to need a calculator. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, there's a whole bunch of rules. That's probably the hardest thing is to remember is the rules, and 
anything radio typically cannot be encrypted. It doesn't matter if you're using GMRS or FRS radios. So you can buy these, you know, bubble pack radios at like Best Buy, and they may have a, a they can't sell them in the United States encrypted anymore. It used to be able to, you could sell them with encryption feature, but they can't anymore. But they have this privacy thing. And I'm going to tell you that privacy is not privacy. Um, the privacy codes, like if you say your, your family is going to be on this one privacy code, if somebody turns off the privacy code, they can still hear you. All that does is um, your family won't hear anything but you. It doesn't mean you know, you know, they won't hear any, any other privacy codes. But if you listen to it on the air without the privacy code turned on, you can hear everything. There's no, there's no encryption in the United States. A lot of them over the air, except for the military, because they they can do anything they want. But well, and the police and the you know the the well yeah right yeah yeah can encrypt right yeah exactly. But even that encryption is pretty weak. Um, it's just enough so the average listener doesn't doesn't want to hear it. If you if you know if, if you have enough energy to figure it out, you can do it fairly fairly easily. Well, I thought they were going. I thought the new radios were doing AES. 256 or oh are they okay well yeah, it, yeah so yeah they, they kind of jacked it up like that was one thing i was going to talk about is you know there was a whole discussion i found where people were discussing could you break the encryption well one you know well yeah the, not not that not, not easily <laughs> yeah what, what would be the point of including encryption in these devices if it was all easily broken like like right especially for sensitive information and then the second thing is it's illegal to do it's illegal to even try like it's right. not even, it's not illegal to decrypt it it's illegal to even try to decrypt it right yeah, so I mean, the way, the way they were doing it before was more obscurity, security through obscurity. You know, it was if they're going to something that's you know, two fifty six isn't super strong, but it's strong enough. You know. Yeah, I'd be kind of interested to hear how you know what what, you, what comes out of your your thing there. So yeah, it'd be interesting. Do you know does the, does the city use AS two fifty six as well? So I think they are. Okay. Although, although some of the things my sons told me about their security practices, I just shake my head. I, I don't want to say it is. No, no, no. I, I, I so. Um, but, but you know, they they have like limits on how long a password can be. Just crazy stuff, like you know. Yeah. So I I, I don't know much about that. So I know their their risk guy, um, Joe Lindstrom, and he tells me things that's going on there. So I I kind of hear some things. He's not overly technical, so he doesn't always give me all the details. But, and I think it's that normal tension of like ease of use versus real security. Absolutely. So you know, I, I work for Marriott, and our whole thing is about ease of use. And anytime we do something simple, like maybe go from a four pin to a six pin on your phone, we we hear about it for a long, long time. How comp, how it makes everything complicated now. So yeah, I understand completely. <laughs> our associates are not very technical at all you know the people who are cleaning are cleaning the room around the front desk are typically aren't very computer or overly computer literate so when you make it something different they don't like change i mean just just like if somebody tells you a password can't be more than eight characters and it's case insensitive yeah well, okay well that's that's weak <laughs> yeah. yeah that's weak no we don't do that we we give you a maximum of 26 a minimum of eight i think mixed mixed case yeah, yeah, that's that's a, that's that doesn't make sense. <laughs> so yeah, you know, the the city and the county are very stark differences from each other. You know, I I deal with Jack Parkey from the county, and, and I know Joe and a couple of people from the city, as well as the health department. So before coronavirus, the health department actually has a couple of go kits. So like in the event they would need to roll out radios, um, they would have everything everything together. And they've had them for they had them for like three or four years, and they wanted us to come in and, and look at them. And everything's still in the plastic. They didn't. They didn't know we hooked it up and tried it. How would you know if you got out there? They even worked. So we were supposed to go out and work with them for a couple of days and set them up and show them how to work them. Then the pandemic hit, and literally the week before we did, everything started shutting down. We were talking to them. We knew then that the pandemic was going on because we were in a room with them, and they were preparing for it. So um, that's when they were thinking they might want to use it, you know, at a certain site, like in the, you know somewhere at a vac- you know, vaccination site or something. They didn't know, but we never tested it out. Yeah, but so that's funny because um, the county, I went to the county EOC, and they have radio gear that's all broken. It's in go kits, but it's broken. So, yeah, it's, it's funny. Differences in the in the different groups. Yeah, 
for uh, some of these uh, remote uh, Pi installations for LoRaWAN or APRS digipeters, what uh, what does the power situation look like? Uh, if I want to power these things for a, a period of time remotely, um, I, I guess my very amateur installation would differ greatly from uh, seeing some of the camera footage of um, what a, a repeater room looks like with real uh, actual power to it. But um, what do you have recommendation-wise for that? So it depends on what kind of output power you're you're talking about. So um, the at the repeater site, the Raspberry Pi that I have is one APRS has a daughter board on it. Um, it's called uh, um, TNC Pi, I think. Yeah, TNC Pi. And so it requires a little bit of power, but the radio is what requires the most power. Um, you can get, so like the stuff behind me is all running off solar. And none of that is powered by AC, except for the, except for the monitors. The monitors are being powered by AC. Everything else is running off batteries. I don't know if you can see them on the floor. And just one, one right, just one right down here somewhere, but um, there's three of them down there, and they're they're charged by two solar panels outside. So this this whole thing runs off of solar. I have quite a bit of equipment, more than probably most, um, and it does get low sometimes, but it picks it charges it during the day as long as it's good. It's gonna be careful in non sunny days, you know, how much how much I use it. I do have a battery charger that's that's there if I need it. I just don't normally turn it on. It's um. So I'm out on this side. Yeah, this side. Right here, this panel, that's a solar charger in the middle. The sol the solar and then to the left is the AC charger. I just turn I just leave it off all the time. So unless I really need it. If I'm if I'm doing a contest on a weekend and it's raining, like if um well I know we kinda of talked about contesting a little bit, but basically it's they call it radio sport where you contact people for points and you're transmitting a lot at that point. And so the battery does go down fairly quickly and I may turn the AC unit on at that point if I have to. I try not to because depending on the contest, I may get points for not using AC, using all solar and natural. natural. Not all contests have that, have that requirement though. So to answer your question, it really depends on the, your, the power you're gonna draw for your radio and how often you're gonna transmit. You look at the duty cycle and see what it would be. And then, um, the stuff on the mountain, you can't compare it because we have commercial AC power there. And we also have the little room that I showed you has 1,200 amp hours of battery. Um, and then the, the other room only has 800 amp hours of battery. Um, so the 1,200 amp hour batteries are getting quite old. They need to be replaced here soon. But uh, so we have what well, they call it e-power. So if you look on the repeater site, it'll say e-power. So in the, in the event that we lose power, we can stay up for quite a while. Because sometimes you lose, you lose power because of a storm, you need the radio to communicate. We have our Skywarn on on that one repeater, so it needs to stay up for a while. So, but if you're just doing something like APRS or something like that, it depends on your duty cycle. The APRS I have is very busy because it's actually a digipeter and an iGate. But if you're just looking to do minimal transmissions, it all depends on the, um, how much power you're using and what size radio you have. The the Pi lasts forever on battery. I mean, anything. They hard to use anything on a, on a on a big 12 volt battery. If you you know, take it down to to five volts, it it runs for many many days, many many days. So, do you have to do anything like um, uh, I think back in the Arduino days, you uh, uh, do something to limit the amount of power or have it come out of sleep every uh, 10 minutes or something like that. Um, is there just some base backline uh, power being consumed all the time, no matter what or high? Yeah, when it, when it comes to radios and repeaters, it's on all the time. Um, like this, these weather things that I do, I guess is a Wemos D1, it goes to sleep for, and it comes up every minute. So the solar panel charges the battery, and every minute it pops up and, and takes a rating and, and then goes back down again. So um, those are power mains. But when it comes to repeater and radio gear, that's just up all the time. And it's not really... I guess you could, depending on what you were doing. If you're just going to transmit your location, like, um, I'll give you an example that I experimented with. Um, it was beehives and beehives, and I was using APRS to, to send out um, temperature and noise level and humidity uh, of the beehive, and it would wake up every 10 minutes, take a reading, transmit, and then the the radio was always on. I couldn't turn it off, but the the Arduino itself would go to sleep for 10 minutes. So it was doing some power management there, but that's about it. Thank you. Yeah.
there's so many things, so many fun things you can do in amateur radio, especially if you like experimenting with things. Like I said, air cape press is a great example. If you want to put a sensor somewhere and you want to, you want to um, have it send in data to it'll go to if you go to aprs.fi on on the web browser, it'll give you a map of all the APRS that's out there. It's actually, it's pretty amazing. I can show you that since I got it here. Um, and you can see, you can see like the temperature of my Arduino in the room and everything from from my APRS. Um, let's see. Here's, uh, so this is APRS.fi. And let's see, where are we here? 15. So I'm located. Where's Frederick? Right here, you see K3DO right here. It's that's my weather system. If you click on it, it's gonna first of all it's showing you how it's getting to. So I'm transmitting it over the air. And you can see I'm talking to the Digipeter, which is up here. And Digipeter is gonna show you all the other things. So you can follow a packet around like where a packet goes. That's one of the things you can do. But if you click on I lost myself. My weather system, for example. It gives you information like what the current temperature is, uh, winds at 345 degrees, we're gusting right now at 6.9 miles an hour, that type of thing. So that's just weather. That's what WX stands for. But if you click on some of these other ones, let me see if I can find an actual person that's moving around here. Uh, I thought I saw somebody. Okay, well, here's somebody's. Okay, somebody's moved around up here in Hagerstown. Let me find them. So you can see this line. This is where they've been tracking with their movement. They only report in every so often, so it's not like you track every every type of movement. But you have to turn that on, obviously. You don't want to be tracked. You don't have to be tracked. 